Hey, you want to learn how to do Midian Ardor? Come with me. Hey, it's Anfa. Ardor's MIDI workflow is a bit strange. It's also a little bit lacking and sometimes even buggy. Despite this, every month on my live streams, I play dozens of amazing tracks made with Ardor. And I don't even mean my own ones. I mean viewer submissions. So how do they do it? How do I do it? I'll show you. In this video, I will teach you everything there is to know about Ardor MIDI. If you'd like a written version of this tutorial, check a link in the video description. Also check the timestamps if you'd like to search for a specific thing. And as I'm recording this, the latest official release is Ardor 6.3. You better get yourself something to drink, Mike. You ready? This is what Ardor 6.3 looks like when you open it and create a new session. There's a few settings I highly recommend you change before we start making sounds. First thing, go to Edit, Preferences, MIDI, and make sure Sound MIDI notes as they are selected in the editor is enabled. With this setting on, Ardor will play any MIDI notes you touch in the editor. Otherwise, the only way to hear what you're doing is to play the timeline. Another important thing is independent MIDI region copies. Go to Session, Properties, MISC, and select MIDI region copies are independent. Then click Use these settings as defaults, so you don't have to change this for every session you create. Why do I recommend you change this? By default, any copied MIDI regions you will have are going to be actually referencing the same file on disk. So when you make a copy and you change the copy, the original will also change. And you might not notice until much later when it's already long gone and for you've forgotten what was there. That's why I recommend you disable this. And I disable this every time I install Ardor. There are some people who are using it. I think this is a very cool feature, but currently it's lacking visual feedback and usability. So I think it's more trouble than it's worth. While we are here, there's another setting and it's policy for handling overlapping notes on the same MIDI channel. It's usually not a valid thing to have two MIDI notes playing the same sound on the same MIDI channel. Uh, and you can choose to make Ardor deal with that in various ways. But I personally, I just handle that stuff manually. However, if you're having lots of problems with stuck notes, you may want to play with this setting. Okay. Another thing I always enable right away when I start Ardor for the first time is the editor mixer. You can open this up in view, show editor mixer, or by using the shift E keyboard shortcut. What this will do is display a single mixer strip for the track we have currently selected on our timeline, which is very useful. And uh, thanks to this, I hardly ever go to the full-blown mixer view. Now that our environment is ready, let's look into creating MIDI tracks. MIDI tracks are what allows us to record, sequence, and edit MIDI data that can drive virtual or physical instruments. There's three ways to open the dialog window for adding tracks. One is from the main menu, you can go to track, add track, bus, or VCA. Or you can use the Control shift n shortcut. You can memorize it as N for new track. And the third way is you can right-click on the empty space in the track headers, not in the timeline itself. That does nothing. Okay, let's change the track type to MIDI. And you can see that the available settings have changed a little. They're all described in the dialog itself. You can reference this help box here, though so I'll explain all the settings anyway. So first you can choose how many tracks you want to add. You can type in a number. Uh, obviously we can specify the name. Um, for the track or tracks to be created. If you create multiple tracks, Ardor will add sequential numbers to make the track names unique because no two tracks or buses can have the same name. Below, you can select an instrument plugin. By default, it's set to General MIDI Synth, which is a stock Ardor instrument plugin, which unsurprisingly plays a General MIDI sound font present on your system. You can also select None, which is on the top of the list to create the MIDI track without any virtual instrument added, and you can insert it yourself later. Uh, by the way, you can just press the home key to jump to none right away. Paging up and down also is possible. Now, I have a lot of third-party instrument plugins installed, but Ardor comes with a pretty limited set by default. Uh, for now, I will select the general MIDI synth. Pin mode is mostly useful for audio tracks. 
If you set it to strict I.O., which is the default, it's going to make sure that the amount of output audio ports is the same as the number of input audio ports, regardless of what plugins you insert and how you route the signal internally. Uh, flexible I.O. is not going to restrict that, so sometimes it's a better option. <laughs> For MIDI tracks, this doesn't matter that much unless you want to add additional audio input channels to your MIDI track. Uh, for example, if you want to use it as a vocoder. And by the way, like these here are actually templates. Like this is just for convenience. You can create any track and transform it into any other by adding and removing input outputs and adding plugins and such. And the last setting is position. This determines where vertically in your session the track will be inserted. First, obviously, puts it on the top of your session, last, insert it, and the bottom. And there's also before selection and after selection. These are useful if you have a lot of tracks in your session and spawning a new track on the, on the bottom and then having to grab and drag it up is going to take some time. There's two things we can do now. We can add selected items and leave the dial open, or we can add and close. Okay, I'm gonna just change the number of tracks to one and add the track. Okay, here's the MIDI track. Okay, now I want to show you some operations on tracks. First, let's learn how to duplicate tracks. To duplicate a track, right-click on its header and choose Duplicate. Here we have a dialog window. We can, of course, select how many duplicates we want to create. And we can also decide what happens with the track's playlist. I'm going to cover playlists in a while, so don't worry about this for now. And also, we have the position setting just like with inserting new tracks. I want to place seven duplicates. So we have eight tracks in total. Let's click OK. And here's our track duplicates. As you can see, Ardor added sequential numbers to make the track names unique. All right, mm, let's say I changed my mind and I want to get rid of these tracks. Now I'm going to show you how to select and delete tracks. To select a track, just click on its header or the name. If you want to select more, hold Control, and click more. Now, if you want to select a whole range at once, hold shift and click on a track, and this will select all the tracks in between as well. All right, now to delete the tracks, I'm going to right click on the header and choose remove. Ardol will let us know that deleting tracks is permanent and there is no undo. So if you're not sure, it's a good idea to first make a snapshot of your session so you'll be able to go back. Uh, I'm going to show you how to make snapshots in a while, but for now, let's just delete these tracks. Okay, we've got the tracks we want. Let's now rename them. To rename a track, double click on the name and it comes into edit mode and you can type. Let's call it piano still. Now, instead of switching off and switching to edit the name of another track, I can just hit tab and this will instantly go to the next track where I can type the new name. Also, shift tab will go backwards. And this is very useful if you want to rename tracks in large numbers. Hit enter to finish. Sometimes you know that you're not going to need a track for a while, but you will need it later. So right now it's only hogging your resources and taking up screen space. To help with that, we can deactivate and hide tracks. Deactivated tracks are not processed by Ardor, so they do not consume any CPU time. They still will, however, occupy your RAM. So if you have a heavy sampler like Drum Gizmo, um, that's you know using five gigs of your RAM, that's not gonna help with that. You will need to remove the track instead. Okay, so let's deactivate the track. I'm gonna deactivate the Piano 2 track. Let's right click and select Click on this active checkbox. You can see that the track header is now grayed out. There's no buttons and the name is in parentheses now. And I also can't do anything here. So this track is now deactivated. We can now hide this track as well. Now, hidden tracks are not deactivated by default. This, these are separate things. So a hidden track can still be active and can play sounds. Um, you could use that to spook your collab mates. But please don't use loud sounds or I will personally shred your system disk's partition table and then I will also eat your lunch. Okay, let's now hide this track. Right click and select hide. Note that the same options are often available in the track menu. You can select the track and go duplicate, remove or toggle active. Now to unhide the tracks, we will need to use another tool called 
the editor list. You can open it up from the view menu by selecting show editor list or use the convenient shortcut shift L. Uh, the editor list is a very powerful tool and it has lots of tabs, but conveniently for us, what we need is right on top in the tab trucks and buses. Uh, if I extend this a little, you can see that there's quite a lot of switches here, and if you use the tooltips, you can learn more about them. You can pretty much manage all the properties of your tracks here. But what interests us is the V for visible and A for active. So we can make a track visible again and make it active again as well. Tab and shift tab also switches between the tracks and you can rename them here too. Neat! Okay, this is a bit tangential to the MIDI topic, but I think it's a good idea to teach you this. Ardor can manage multiple versions of your project. Uh, it's uh, the .ardor file, which contains all the information of the layout of regions and automation data and plugins, etc. And what I do every time I sit to work another session on a project is create a new snapshot and switch to it. So that what I've done before is saved in a separate file and now I'm working on a new file. Mm, to do this, go to the main menu session and select snapshot and switch to new session. What this will do is ask you if you want to save the changes first and yeah, let's save them. Now we can add a new name. I'm going to type MIDI Ardor MIDI 02 and hit save. And now this has created a new project file on disk. Mm, to access an old snapshot, we can do various things. We can go to the editor list and just select a snapshot from here. Or we can go to session recent. And here you can see that if I hit this little arrow, we're going to get a list of all the snapshots of this particular session. If you hover your mouse, you'll also see what version of Ardor the snapshot was modified with last time. I name my snapshots with incremental numbers, so it's always clear which one is the newest version. So Ardor will automatically load the newest snapshot anyway, if you just select to load the project from the recent menu. So if I close it and just hit this and go open, you can see that we have loaded the second snapshot, which is great. Finally, we can record some MIDI. Assuming you have a MIDI controller keyboard or a MIDI dance pad, I will now show you how to capture your performance. If you don't have such devices, Ardor has options for you too, and I will discuss them in a moment. First thing you need to do is obviously make sure that your device is connected to your computer. Mine is a USB keyboard. Now let's select the MIDI track you want to record on and click on the input button. It's the second button below the one with the name of the track. If I click here, you can see that we have a few options. First, we'll disconnect all the inputs and Next is a section of various MIDI inputs that Ardor has detected in the system. There's this MIDI through thing, and also there is my keyboard, M-Audio Oxygen 49. So I will select it, and now it's displayed here as the input for this track. Now if I hit a key on my keyboard, Ardor receives that, sends it to the general MIDI synthesizer, which turns the MIDI signal into a stereo audio signal, and it goes down the track to the master bus and to my headphones and to your ears as well. We've made sound. Now to capture a performance, we need to first arm the track for recording by using this red circle button. And we also need to arm the whole session for recording, which is done with a similar button here in the transport panel. So we could manually just press this and then start the transport to record. But we could also just press shift space, which will do the same thing for us. Now to stop the capture, just press spacebar again. Now, if you've recorded something terrible, 
that you want to forget about immediately, press Control Space, which will stop the recording, delete what was just captured, and rewind your playhead as if nothing has ever happened. I saw nothing. A very useful option for transport is the auto return function. You can enable it here or by pressing the 7 key on your alphanumeric keypad. What it does is it will rewind the playhead to the point where you started the playback when you stop it. So start playback, stop it, the playhead goes back to start. This is very useful for two things. One is re-recording a part over and over if you don't want to delete anything. So you could use control spacebar for that. And the second thing is auditioning a part of your timeline over and over if you don't want to manually rewind. For example, if you're tweaking a synthesizer setting or tweaking some automation or just sitting in the mixer view and tweaking the mix, uh, you can use auto return and just play and stop over and over to hear what you've done and iteratively improve on it, hopefully. Now, let's talk about playlists. Each track has a playlist, at least one. You can access them with this P button right here. If I click here, you can see we have one playlist present on this track. The name of the playlist is the same as the track. What we can do is we can create more playlists. For example, if I create new, I can give it a new name or just go with the default one. And it seems like I've just deleted my work. And that's not true. If I go and click this button again, you can see we have two playlists and I can go right back to the previous one. What this is useful for is storing alternate takes for different parts. For example, when I record vocals for a song, I often have multiple sessions and I store these multiple takes from different sessions on different playlists because I'm not going to alter the processing anyway. So having multiple duplicate tracks just to keep them stored is not necessary. But of course you can do that. Now, one downside of the playlists is that you cannot access two of them at the same time unless you create another extra track. So if I, for example, had something cool recorded on the second playlist and wanted to comp that with my first one, what I would have to do is, for example, use another track as a buffer. So I could click, middle click and drag, now change the playlist here and middle click and drag again to have both of these regions present on the same playlist. Now let's go back to the situation where each take is on its own playlist. What I can do is use another MIDI track to access the other playlist. So let's go here, choose select from all. And here we have a list of all the MIDI playlists inside of this session. First, of course, there is the playlist of this Piano 2 track, which is just one playlist, and there's other tracks. And we can select Piano and choose Piano.1. And you can see that immediately we have the region we've previously recorded. And this way we can also click and drag it on this first track. I'm going to show you much more ways of managing MIDI regions, etc. During this video, but I just wanted to show you how you can use playlists. <laughs> One thing to note maybe is that sometimes I have issues with playlists. There tend to be name collisions between different tracks. Uh, so if I use multiple playlists or try to select different playlists, sometimes a playlist gets used in a different track I didn't intend. It's a little bit buggy, but it can also be useful. Now, the remaining options here are, of course, we can make a new copy, which will going to duplicate the current playlists. But we can alter this, the things on that playlist while still having the old one present. So this can be used kind of like snapshots for MIDI tracks, that you can have alternate edits of different regions. Because, yeah, if I go back to the first playlist, here we have the same regions, but in the previous state. Another useful thing for recording is metronome or click. To enable it, you can use the button on the toolbar right here, or you can use the tilde key on your keyboard. If you hover your mouse, you can also read some nice tips. You can change the volume of the metronome with your mouse wheel, or if you right click, you're going to be transported to the preferences metronome settings where you can also change the volume or 
or do whatever. Now, some good news for those of you who don't have access to a MIDI controller keyboard or a MIDI dance pad for that matter. Ardor 6 has introduced a virtual keyboard. To open it, go to Window and select Virtual Keyboard. Now, the Virtual Keyboard window will stay on top of other windows. Um, so unless you put it away in a corner like this and you forget about it, uh, you should know what's going on. Um, and that's important because when it is open, it's going to steal some of your keys. So instead of triggering actions like they would normally do, they are going to trigger um, MIDI notes. So for example, you know, the A key is audition. It's going to play and solo the track. But if I have the virtual keyboard open, the A key now is C4. So this is really good if you don't have a MIDI controller, but it also has quite a lot of options. So I'm going to now break it down for you. So by default, you have one and a half octaves map to your QWERTY keyboard. You, you can change that. And uh, if you go to Edit, Preferences, MIDI, and then in the section Virtual Keyboard, we can change the keyboard layout used. The default one is QWERTY Single, uh, because only one row of keys on your alphanumeric keyboard, keyboard are going to be used. Actually, it's two rows because you have white keys and black keys, but it's called QWERTY Single. And there's also QWERTY. And if I enable that, you can see that the layout of the keys on the keyboard has changed. And now we are starting from Z, and we go up to M, and then from Q we go up to P and we have two and a half octaves almost. Um. Now, alphanumeric keyboards are not made to press a lot of keys at once. It's a tool to be able to do anything when you don't have this, the right tool to do that, which is a MIDI controller keyboard. Now, an interesting thing is that by my request, there was an option added to use mouse only so that the virtual MIDI keyboard doesn't map any keys on your keyboard and you can still use them to trigger hotkeys, but you can use it with your mouse. And sometimes that's all you need. So, okay, uh, of course you can trigger MIDI notes, but what does the other stuff do? Well, from the left, uh, we can change the MIDI channel that the notes are being sent on, uh, notes and also MIDI CCs, as you'll see in a moment. Here we have a virtual pitch band, so we can play a note and pitch it. I'm going to maybe enable the QWERTY single, yep, and there's a tooltip with some extra options here. We also have a mod wheel, which for this instrument creates vibrato. Now we have four MIDI CC controls. We can select any MIDI CC we want. The first one is, of course, the modulation wheel. That's why it's not present here, because it's already present. And you can select any MIDI CC you want and send the MIDI CC messages. And you have four of these. Next, we have a section where we can change the range of notes visible on this virtual keyboard. And the first thing determines what octave does the middle note have. Now, by default, it's four, so we have C4 can do 2, and now it's C2, which also changes our keyboard assignments. And because the MIDI notes don't go lower than C-1, um, our keyboard is also getting a little bit shorter. <laughs> Let's go back to C4. We can also change the range, which is the amount of octaves. Now we can also scale this keyboard if you want. We can have 11 octaves. Oh, we can't have 11 octaves, wow. Okay. The next thing is um, the default velocity of the notes sent. We can click this to select a few common values. Now, um, of course, we have no velocity sensing on a typing keyboard, uh, but this allows us to mimic that. And if you use your mouse wheel, you can tweak that manually. I guess 100 is a good default. 
Now, the next thing is chromatic transpose, which means uh, we can have the output MIDI notes being sent in a different key than what we're playing in. So I'm playing like uh, the white keys of the C major, major scale, but we're outputting C sharp major. So that's a little cheater mode for you. And last but not least, we have the panic button that will kill all playing notes. So that's the virtual MIDI keyboard for you. Now let's talk about another MIDI tool that could be useful and it's called MIDI Tracer. We access it from Window, MIDI Tracer. It's right below the MIDI keyboard. MIDI Tracer is a tool that lets you investigate what MIDI messages are being sent or received on various ports in Ardor. I can, for example, select the virtual keyboard and I can inspect what it's doing when I'm tweaking this knob. And you can see it's sending a controller change on channel one, CC number 07 and value 36, etc. Okay, so this verifies that we're actually doing things. And underneath we have a bunch of settings, but I'll leave them for you to explore. Now, as you can see, as soon as I close my virtual keyboard window, my keyboard is back to normal. So it's no longer triggering MIDI notes. Let's go back to our MIDI track and I'm going to show you now how to create MIDI regions manually, that is with mouse, uh, as opposed to capturing our performance. We're going to be sequencing MIDI data manually. To create a MIDI region, first we need to go to the draw mode you can access it from the toolbar. It's this one, draw mode, or you can just hit the D key, D for draw. Now let's create a MIDI region on the second track. I'm going to click and drag, and this creates a MIDI region. It's empty, but if I hover my mouse inside, you can see that there is a little phantom note already present and Ardor shows us a hint as to what MIDI note it's going to be, what channel, what velocity. And I can just click and drag to create notes. Now to access all the different modes, I recommend you learn the hotkeys because it's gonna save you a lot of time. My list of hotkeys for you is G to grab, R for range mode, D to draw, E to edit, T for time stretch, and C for cut. Learn the hotkeys is gonna save you a lot of time in the long run. All right, this is cool and all, but the MIDI region and the notes are not obeying the grid. So let's fix this. To do that, we'll need to enable snapping. So let's click here to enable snapping and select maybe a quarter note. You can see that our grid has changed to reflect that grid density. Let's press G to enter grab mode. I'm going to hover my mouse over the middle of the region, click and drag left to move it. Now I'm going to hover my mouse over the right edge until the cursor changes shape to let me know that I can click and drag to change the length of the region. Let's release it here and now it should last exactly one bar. And it does. We'll insert some notes in a while and make this an actual interesting MIDI clip, but first I need to talk about navigating the view. Ardor doesn't have a dedicated piano roll. Uh, instead, each track has its own piano roll embedded in the track itself, so you'll be editing your MIDI notes right in the timeline. This is a little bit uncommon, but once you get used to it, it gets the job done. However, you'll be constantly changing size of the tracks to have enough room to be precise with your MIDI editing. I'll show you how to do that right now. You can quickly focus your selection by hitting the Z key. That will make whatever you've selected fill the entire view and deselect it so that you have maximum space to work on. By the way, we could close this editor list by pressing Shift L. We can select this and press Z again to make it fill the view. So now we see as much uh, of this track as possible. Now, a little problem with uh, the Z key is that it doesn't resize automation lanes. So for example, if I had two automation lanes here, you see that they are not getting resized and I need to manually make them smaller and then use the Z key again to actually maximize my MIDI editing area. To get back to the previous view, press the Shift Z key combination, which works like undo, but for view changes. You can use it multiple times to go back multiple steps. 
If you use the Z key without selecting anything, it's going to try to fit all the tracks and make them fill the view. Again, Shift Z to undo the view change. Another useful hotkey is F. F will maximize the selected tracks. However, it only works if you have track headers selected. So if I select these two and press F, it's going to make sure these are vertically maximized. Let's press Shift Z. And if I press F now and I don't have any track selected, it's not gonna work because regions don't count. Also, another problem is if you use F to maximize an automation lane, Shift Z is not going to restore it to its previous height. So you'll need to do this manually. I've reported that as a bug. Let's now zoom in manually. First, I'll hold control and use my mouse wheel to zoom in and out on the mouse cursor. We can also zoom in and out using the three buttons on the far right of this toolbar. Zoom out, zoom in, and also zoom to session, which will make sure that everything between the start and end markers is visible horizontally. If you need some more zooming options, go to view, zoom, and you can also learn some hotkeys here. Now let's resize the track to get more space vertically for our piano roll. To do that, first hover your mouse over the track header and now move down until the cursor changes shape. This lets you know that if you now click and drag, you're gonna change the size of the track. Now there's a bunch of other ways to change track height, so I'm gonna show them all to you so you can pick which ones are going to fit your style. If you right click on a track header and go to height, you can select from a bunch of predefined heights, ranging from small to normal to largest. You can also use free controls on the toolbar. Right here we have control to shrink tracks and expand selected tracks. And also this button here changes the number of visible tracks at once vertically. So if we select all, it's going to maximize all the tracks of the session. And well, sometimes it's gonna fail. If you have like 50 tracks, it's probably not gonna be able to fit them all, but it will try. Now, another way to change track's height is by double clicking on the lower part of the header. If you double click there, uh, the track will toggle between the largest and the normal sizes. Which I think is pretty cool because if you want to do some quick editing, you can just double click and then you have space for piano roll, you're done with it, you double click again and it's small. So it only works if you're on the lower part if I double click here, it's not going to do anything. I guess developing a habit of zooming in vertically and on of expanding and, a high and shrinking track height can mitigate the lack of a separate piano roll editor to some degree. And I think this approach has its upsides as it's easier to view the context of what you're editing in the whole project. However, for a few years of using Ardor MIDI, I was longing for an external piano roll when I came from LMMS. Okay, now you know how to zoom around. Let's show you how to scroll the view. The mouse wheel can do it alone with some modifier keys. Let's add a bunch of tracks just to fill in the view. Mouse wheel alone will scroll the track list up and down. Mouse wheel with a control will zoom in and out horizontally. Mouse wheel with shift will scroll the timeline forward and back. And mouse wheel with Alt is going to change height of the track you're hovering over. <laughs> so that's one extra way to change the height of the track. Now, page up and page down keys will also scroll the tracks for you. And if you are zoomed in, home and end keys are going to move your playhead and view to the start marker or the end marker of your session. Another way to zoom in horizontally is by using the summary panel. It's this one thing here. So if you click and drag, you can scroll the view horizontally. If you click on an edge and drag, you can change the horizontal zoom level. Also, if you use the mouse wheel, you're going to zoom in and out on the center of currently viewed area. You can also right click and select reset summary to extents, which will do the same thing as clicking this button here. Now let's talk about grid snapping. If you don't know, grid snapping lets you make sure that whatever you do on the timeline is going to follow the musical time of your 
meter and tempo so that it's going to be aligned to even musical divisions of time. So for example, you move a region or you move a note and it's going to snap to the grid lines. You can enable uh, and disable snapping you by using this snap button on the toolbar or by using four on your alphanumeric keypad or by going to edit menu and selecting toggle snap which does this uh, as you can see by the two mm, hotkeys here you can also change the snapping grid resolution by using the keys six and five on your alphanumeric keypad so you can go to the next and go to the previous grid setting using the key five. So four toggle snapping, five previous and six next grid setting. Now, an important thing is that if you have snapping enabled at any time, you can hit and hold alt and that is going to temporarily disable snapping. If I leave alt go again, I am snapping to the grid. Now it also works in reverse. If I disable snapping and I move something and then hold alt, it's going to snap to the grid temporarily. As soon as I release alt, I'm back to no grid. <clears throat> I usually work with snapping enabled and whenever I need to move something out of the grid, I just hold alt and release myself from it. Snapping will also help you align objects together. For example, here I have this region which doesn't end on the grid, the grid is quarter notes. But if I want to draw another region, uh, let's move this out of the way, I want to draw another region and I can drag and as you can see snapping is enabled and it makes sure that this re new region I'm drawing here is aligned with the end of that region. Even though they don't follow the grid specifically. And even if I go to snapping and no grid at all, Still, if I draw a region, it snaps to an existing region edge. And the same is true for markers. For example, if I move this region, its start is going to snap to the marker. Or if I move it somewhere else, its end is going to snap if I resize it. And this is with no grid. It's just snapping between objects themselves. Before Ardor 6, this kind of aligning to different, you know, region ed bounds and markers was done with special snapping modes. But in Ardor 6, they have been unified and it's all kind of automatic. And I think it's a good idea. Since the grid lets your editing follow the musical time, now let's talk about actually changing the meter and tempo of your session so that the grid snapping enforces your musical vision. Please know that the tempo map functionality is most likely going to change a lot in Ardor 7, but for now, Ardor 6.3 is the newest stuff, so I'm gonna cover it as it is. To simply change the tempo of your session, you can do a few things. One thing is double click on the tempo marker to open the edit tempo dialog. Another way is to right click on one of the clocks and select edit tempo, or under the secondary clock, there is this tempo button. And if you click on it, it gives you the same result. Now let's talk about this edit tempo dialog. Mm, the first thing is you can tap the tempo with your mouse or with the keyboard once you select the button with your mouse. And this will help you set your tempo. You can, of course, just type it in. And uh, the last setting we see here is the tempo type this is actually like the tempo marker type, and it's either constant or ramped. If we select ramped, what happens is that it lets us define what the tempo is going to be at the end of the ramp. Now, because we have just one tempo marker in our session so far, creating a ramp doesn't make sense because the ramp would have to go to infinity. So I'm going to select constant. Yeah, we have 140, let's hit apply. And you can see our MIDI regions have moved forward because the musical time has changed and everything shrunk a little bit. To change the meter, also known as the time signature, we can similarly double click on the meter marker where we can just type in a value, how many beats per bar we want. Uh, it takes fractions, which is uh, interesting. I have never used fractions, so. 
And we can also choose what note is the bass line. Here we have four quarter notes, so time signature of 4-4, four, four, but we can have time signature of 4-8 or 6-8. Now, similarly to the tempo, you can right-click on any clock and select Edit Meter. Or you can just click on this Time Signature button right here and get the same effect. Let's create a tempo ramp. Uh, as you already know, we need to have another tempo marker for that. And to create one, we can do two things. Either Control and click on the ruler, or right-click and select New Tempo. Now we have one more than we need. Now let's right click on the existing marker and select Remove. All right, now I can double click on this second marker, insert a new tempo, hit Apply, and to make a ramp between the two, I can right click on the first one and select Ramp to Next. And that will create a smooth transition between one tempo to the other. Now, if we edit the first marker, you can see that our end beats per minute value is set to the value of the next tempo marker, and it's set to ramped. But we can do something weird. We can change this value and apply, and now you can see that our tempo starts at 140 beats per minute. It's raising up to the third bar where it's at 200 beats per minute, but then it's immediately changing to 100 beats per minute. So we can see that we can do some unusual things. Now, again, this is going to change a lot, so I have no idea what it's gonna look like in Ardor 7, but probably it's going to be much more flexible too. With new meters, there is no such uh, interesting stuff to do. Basically, we can um, select the new meter, maybe we can have eight quarter notes now, and uh, we can type in what bar the meter change starts at. Let's apply, and we have a new meter starting right here. Another thing you might have noticed is that the markers have this setting called lock style. And what it does is, by default it's set to music, what it does is a marker will maintain its distance to the other markers and music time if it's set to music. If it's set to audio, it's going to use audio time, so minutes, seconds, etc., instead of bars and beats and ticks when it comes to music. So if I set this to music and apply, let's see what happens if I change this first tempo. You can see that this marker moved. Now if I lock it to audio instead and change the tempo again, you see that the marker didn't move, and it's now completely off the grid. So, like, of course, if you're working with music, it makes sense to use the music lock. Uh, but if you're doing some special effects or sound design and using tempo to, uh, to modulate your MIDI data on the timeline, that might be a useful thing to do. All right, back to creating our MIDI notes. <laughs> now, let's make sure we can see what we're doing. I'm going to expand this track and also zoom a little using the summary. I'm also going to make sure that my grid is set to quarter notes, and let's hit the D key to enter the draw mode. Now, in the draw mode, you can click to place a note, and the note length is going to be the same as the grid spacing you've selected here. So if I change to 16th notes, I'm going to enter 16th notes. Remember that you can hold down Alt to release yourself from the grid at any time. So for example, I can start a note at the grid point, but then hold Alt and drag to make the end outside of the grid. And also, Shift right click will delete a note. So I can get rid of those. And we have just one note. I can also click and drag these handles to change the area I'm viewing in this embedded piano roll. Also, while we're at it, if you right click and select note range, you can use fit contents and that should extend your piano rolls view so it, you can see all the notes. It doesn't always work great. There's also a percussive mode for the notes, 
which only shows the note starts. And this is supposedly great for editing drum lines, but I'm really not using it. Let's go back to the sustained mode. Now in the draw mode, you can't select multiple nodes by dragging. Like you can hold shift and click on them to select them. So the draw mode isn't the most suitable for editing MIDI. And that's why we're gonna talk about the edit mode now. All right, so hit the E key to enter the edit mode. Now in edit mode, clicking and dragging doesn't create notes. It, it does rectangular selection. So we can easily select a bunch of notes. To create a note, just hold control and click or click and drag to create a note just like in the draw mode. Holding control gives you exactly the same behavior and you can also hold alt to release you from the grid. I generally prefer the edit mode to do any MIDI editing because it has more options. But you need the draw mode to create the MIDI regions themselves. Now to move notes around, click in the middle and drag. If you click on an edge, you see the cursor changes and I can resize the note in both directions. We can also select multiple notes and drag to change their size in both directions as well. You can select all the notes inside of a region by using the Ctrl A hotkey. Let's now talk about editing velocity. As you probably know, MIDI note velocity is stored as a 7-bit digital number that gives us a range between 0 and 127. And the default note velocity in Ardor is 64, so right in the middle. There's multiple ways to change this value in Ardor, but sadly a lollipop graph is not one of them. Yeah, I know, that sucks. But we can still do some solid MIDI velocity manipulation in Ardor, so bear with me. First, let's select a bunch of notes. Now, control up and down arrows will change the note velocity of selected notes in the increments of 10. And as you see, we have a handy tooltip near the mouse cursor showing us that. If we hold Ctrl and Alt and use the up and down arrow keys, we can do the same thing in increments of one. Using the mouse wheel also will change the note velocity in increments of one. If we hold down Alt while doing so, it's going to change the note velocity in the increments of 10. And finally, you can hit the V key, V for velocity, and type a MIDI note velocity value manually. Now there's two ways to create a note velocity ramp in Ardor. I'm going to show you one right now and we'll talk about the other one later. So the first way to create a velocity ramp is by using Ardor's built-in velocity interpolation. I'll insert two notes at the start and at the end. Now I'm gonna change the velocity of the first note to one and change the velocity of the last note to 127. Now, as I move my cursor, you can see that this phantom note drawn where I would insert a new note is changing velocity depending on where it is located between the two notes. And if I click and insert the notes, it fills up the gaps. And now let's maybe mute the first track and play this. We have a velocity ramp. Now we can tweak this. If I undo a little bit and maybe change, insert a new note in the middle and change velocity of this note to maybe 16, change velocity of this note to maybe 48 and fill in the gaps. Let's play again. We have changed the curvature of the velocity ramp. So that's the first way. I'll talk about the other way in a moment. Um, we're gonna be using the MIDI transform tool, but it's a bit complex and I wanna give it its own section. So before we go to that, let's talk about MIDI channels. Let me create a new MIDI track for this and I'm gonna import an existing region. All right, so here I have a mystery MIDI region. Let me play it to you. In Ardor, every MIDI note can play on a different MIDI channel. If I go to the edit mode and hover my mouse over a note, you can see that it shows me the pitch, then the MIDI channel, this is on channel one, and velocity, which is 100. 
and every note can have a different MIDI channel. If I select a note, or a couple of notes, and press C, a MIDI channel chooser dialog opens up and I can just click and select which MIDI channel I want these notes to be on. And now you can see that they're on MIDI channel 3. Um, let's undo that. They're on MIDI channel 1. Now the problem is that right now to see what MIDI channel the notes are on, uh, the only way is to just hover the mouse and read the text. But there's a better way. If you right click on the track header, we can go to color mode and select channel colors. And now the color of the notes will indicate the MIDI channel they are on. So if I change the MIDI channel of these notes, you can see that they are now orange. Why would you want to have MIDI notes playing on different channels in a single MIDI region? Well, for example, if you're making a orchestral composition, it's much easier to control the harmony and relationships between different voices of instruments if you do that. And since you can have 16 voices in a single MIDI channel, then you can do a lot. And what you can do then is have a master MIDI track, which has the MIDI regions that play MIDI notes on multiple MIDI channels. Then you send the MIDI signal to multiple MIDI buses, which filter out the MIDI tracks to only play a single voice, and then synthesize that into audio with a sampler or a synthesizer. And we're going to do that. All right, so let me change the MIDI channels of this particular MIDI region a little bit. Let's set these to MIDI channel 10. And set these to MIDI channel 7. And now if I move this one octave down or two... You can hear that this MIDI region plays a simple MIDI hip-hop beat. <laughs> okay, why does that work? If I open up the general MIDI synthesizer plugin interface, you can see that it has 16 channels. And by default, everyone is assigned a different instrument from the general MIDI specification. The first channel is Stereo Grand Piano, which is what we're using for the lead line. The channel 10 is a standard drum kit. These are all different drum kits, except for the SFX. Uh, channel 10 in, MIDI, in general MIDI is reserved for drums. For some reason they decided channel 10 is drums. And we're using channel 6, which is FM electric piano, for our bass. Now, let's see what happens if I change MIDI velocities. Uh, let me select a bunch of notes and hit Alt and use the mouse wheel. Now, as you can see, even though the colors of the notes are indicating the MIDI channel, we can still tell what is the velocity of the notes because of these inner dark bars and also the notes transparency or opacity is changing in relation to the velocity. So there's plenty of visual indication to what the notes are doing, which I think is great. Now, having all of these instruments on a single track means that we can't mix them properly because all of the sounds are already mixed together. We can't separate them. But we can. Let's create three MIDI buses and we're going to send the same MIDI signal to each bus, filter it by MIDI channel, and then we'll have all the audio separate for the lead piano, for the bass, and for the drums. I'm going to create three MIDI buses. Now, I want to send the MIDI signal from this track to these buses. So I'm going to click on the output button and go to routing grid. You can also right click on this button to open the routing grid right away. Now we want to go to Ardor buses and you can see on the top we have the tracks. And we have our track and its output channels. We have left and right audio and first MIDI output. So I'm going to just click and drag here to route the first MIDI output to the buses 1, 2, and 3. I'm going to close this. Now, you can hear that our audio got much louder. And it's because, by default, of course, our MIDI buses were created with the general MIDI synthesizer. 
which plays the same audio as this, but we're not filtering the MIDI channels yet. So every single of these buses and our original MIDI track are playing the same sound, which is this gets multiplied four times. What I'm going to do is disable this synthesizer on our original track. And now if I mute our other tracks, you can see that no audio is being sent from this track. But there's audio being produced on these three buses. Let me name the first one piano, name the second one bass, and the third one drums. Now, to filter the MIDI channels, we need to use a MIDI filter plugin. Let's right click, insert a new plugin, go to Plugin Manager, and I'm going to type MIDI channel. And there is a plugin called MIDI Simple Channel Filter. Let's double click to insert it. What this plugin does is lets us select what MIDI channel we want to pass through and it discards everything else. So if we go just leave this on channel one, if I play this now, we can only hear our piano, which is perfect. I'm going to copy this plugin and paste it here. However, there's an easier way to do this. If we go to the full blown mixer view, you can either click on the button in the top right corner or press the Alt-M shortcut on the keyboard. You can see we have all our mixer strips right here. And now if I just click and drag, I can very easily duplicate a plugin between mixer strips. Okay, let's go back to the editor. Now, of course, we need to change what channels are we filtering. So bass is on MIDI channel. Let me look it up. MIDI channel 6. Let's double click here and go MIDI channel six. Now drums are of course on MIDI channel 10. Let's hear it. Now we have everything separate so we can add effects to all of the instruments, change the levels, change the panning, whatever we want. Um, so let's replace the bass with a synthesizer. I'm going to select my bass track, right click, select new plugin, plugin manager, and let's type in Helm. I'm going to double click on the LV2 version, which is what I prefer. And now because we already have an instrument plugin on this MIDI bus, Ardor is going to ask us if we want to replace the plugin or add it as a new one. Let's replace it. And now you can see we have Helm here, which replaced our general MIDI synthesizer. Let's slow the bus and hear what it sounds like. Yeah, so here is our synthetic bass. Let's hear it all together. <clears throat> so now we could change our composition in this MIDI strip. It might be a little bit inconvenient that our parts are overlapping. It would possibly be best to separate the drums to a different track. Let's move this bass two octaves up so it's separate. And now I'm going to go to Helm and move this two octaves down, 24 semitones, so it sounds the same. Let's make this bass a little bit quieter. And there you have it. Of course, this is just a simple demonstration, but I'm using this kind of stuff for orchestral compositions because it really makes it easier to control the harmony. By the way, I recommend you install the X42 MIDI filter plugin pack, which is a free and open source plugin bundle for Linux, Mac and Windows. There's a bunch of very useful plugins there that will help you manipulate your MIDI signal and process the MIDI messages and do all kinds of weird stuff. The fastest way to rename a MIDI region is to hold control and right click on it. That will open up the region properties window where you can just select the name and type right in. And you can hit Alt C to close this dialog. If you select a single MIDI region and right click on it, the first option in the context menu is going to have the name of the region. And there we have MIDI and we have a lot of operations we can do with the MIDI data. Transpose lets you offset the note pitches up and down in octaves or semitones. Very useful. Insert patch change helps you to, well, insert a patch change. Honestly, I never use this. Quantize, also accessible with Alt-5, 
lets you snap the starts and ends of your nodes to your grid, which is useful for tightening up a sloppy performance. Legatize, let me show this to you on another region. All right, so we can see that I use Legatize on this MIDI region and what it does, it extends the MIDI nodes to close all gaps, but it also shortens MIDI nodes to avoid any overlap. You can see if I undo and redo. There's also an option called Remove Overlap. What this does is similar to Legatize, so it will never extend nodes, it will only shorten them to prevent nodes from overlapping. There's also the Transform tool, which we're going to cover in a moment. There's Unlink from other copies. Now, if you have followed my recommendation and enabled the checkbox to make all MIDI copy regions independent, you're never going to have to use that. But if you want to have your MIDI region copies to be linked by default, then this is what you'd use to separate them. And last but not least is the List Editor, which is a tracker-like interface. Basically, you have all the events in a list, or you can audition them, and you can directly change the values, like, oh, I need to type in the octave too, D3. And as you can see, the note moved. Now, this sound of selected MIDI notes button is actually directly linked to the one in preferences. So if you disable this, it's going to be disabled globally. Uh, yep, and that's all the MIDI related stuff you can do on the region level. Now let's go deeper into what you can do on the MIDI note level. So let's, so let's enter the edit mode by pressing the E key and let's select a note. Now if I right click, you can see we have a couple of options. Of course we can delete the notes, but honestly way better is just to use the delete key or even better Hold shift and right click. This will also delete media regions, automation points, even plugins in the processor box, but there is no undo for that. So now for a single MIDI note, you can also open this edit dialog where you can directly change all the properties of the note, like the MIDI channel, the MIDI note pitch, or the velocity. Also the start and end time. Now, it seems like this should be enabled for multiple selected nodes, because if we open it, you can see that there is options to set selected nodes to this channel, so we can like force the same setting for all selected nodes, but it, it's not active for multiple nodes. So I guess this is an unfinished feature. Next, we have, of course, the transpose option, which works exactly the same as uh, on the region level. If we select multiple notes, we're going to have more options. So let's go and see. We have Legatize, of course. We can remove overlap, same as before. Quantize, same as before. And again, MIDI Transform. Okay, with a bunch of notes and open up the MIDI Transform tool. MIDI Transform dialog lets you take some numbers describing MIDI notes and transform them or translate them into other values. For example, you can make the note pitch translate to MIDI note velocity or reverse. What I use it mostly for is to create MIDI ramps and to randomize note velocity. So you can see we have set and we can set the velocity note number, which is the pitch. You can set the start time, length or MIDI channel. And we can set it to this note's velocity, so no change. Or we can translate like the the start time to velocity. Not sure how that's gonna work. Well, somehow. But we can do something like a random number from, and we can randomize the node velocities in a given range. Let's hear that. This is pretty useful. Let's undo that. And of course we can, maybe we would want to replace the node velocity, but we just want to add a little bit of randomness. Actually, we can also do this on the region level. So let's do this here, MIDI transform. And we can do set velocity to this node's velocity, plus we can actually like subtract a random number between one and 32. And that's gonna take the original MIDI velocity 
randomize the number between 1 and 32 and subtract it. So now we have some randomization. So our part sounds more human. It's humanized. What we can also do is use the equal steps from operator, which will create a MIDI velocity ramp. So we can have equal steps from 1 to 127. Let's transform, and here is our MIDI velocity ramp. Now, in earlier versions of Ardor, the MIDI transform was only doable on the region level, so it wasn't very feasible to create like more complex MIDI velocity ramps, but now we can do that, because I can select a bunch of notes, select transform, select equal steps from, and maybe 16 to 64, transform, now select a bunch of other notes, transform, equal steps from, 127 to 8, transform, and we have a two-part MIDI velocity ramp. If you want to soften it a bit, we can also use this built-in MIDI velocity interpolation. So if I just removed something and click in, it's Ardor's going to fill in the gaps to smooth it out. I think there's some weird overlap going on. But remove overlap takes care of that too. Now there's a bunch of different things. You can take different parameters, set it to different things, and apply it to different parameters. And you can also pile a bunch of different stuff. You can do addition, multiplication, division, and modulus. And uh, you can, like, I don't know, interpolate notes, velocities between each other, the next and previous one. You can, like, do velocity smooth or <sighs> weird stuff, like... Um, let me know if you figure out some cool things you can do with MIDI Transform. I'd love to know. Something happened. Now, one of the most basic things in editing is cutting. You can cut MIDI regions just like audio regions using the S key. That's the short tutorial. Let's go to the grab mode. And now I can just hover my mouse over some part and hit S, and we've split the region. Now S is the hotkey for edit, split, slash, separate. And that is going to separate the selected regions at the edit point. Now edit point is defined by this drop-down menu here. By default, it's set to the mouse cursor position, but you can also set it to playhead. Now if I move my playhead to a specific point and press S, the selected region is going to be separated there. Let's undo that. You can also insert a marker and set the edit point to be an active marker. You can see that our marker now has a blue vertical line on it, and that means it's going to be the place our stuff is going to be separated. Ta-da! Let's go back to the mouse edit point, and you can see that when I do that, we do have this blue vertical line under our mouse cursor, but it's snapping to grid. You can see if I move it, it starts to snap, then it breaks loose, it starts to snap again, breaks loose again. Now if I set this snapping to no grid, it's also going to snap, but it's going to snap to objects like region bounds. So this also shows you where snapping works. If I disable snapping altogether, this blue vertical line is not going to snap to anything anymore. Let's enable it, though. So. Now, of course, snapping obeys editing grid. So if you have your grid set to something coarse, you don't need to be as precise. You can just hover your mouse somewhere, press S, and, and know for sure it's being precisely done on the grid. But if your grid is fine, you better zoom in before you cut. Now, cutting can also be done with the cut mode that I've mentioned before. And you can access it with the button on the toolbar or with the C key. Now, cutting with this tool always happens under the mouse cursor, of course, obeying snapping. And it doesn't care for what you have selected. So even if I have my edit point set to playhead, cutting is also always going to be done on the mouse cursor position, snapped to grid. 
Now, if you want to cut multiple regions at once, you can do that. Just select all the regions you want to cut and use the S key. All the regions that were intersected by your edit point are going to be split. If there is a region you are trying to cut that doesn't intersect it, for example here, you can see that this region goes unaffected. Now this is useful if you sometimes want to like uh, rearrange your composition or just cut all the regions vertically. You can hit Ctrl A while in the grab mode to select all the regions, then place your mouse or playhead if you're using playhead as the edit point, wherever you want, and press S to split. Again, all the regions that were intersecting your edit point are going to be split, but the ones outside of that are not going to be altered at all. Now, another useful tool for managing region starts and end points is trimming. Trimming is done with the J and K hotkeys. J will set the MIDI region endpoint to your current edit point, so it could be playhead or it could be mouse, depending on what you set it to. And K will set the out point to your edit point. Now they are not going to touch the contents of the region, so this is very quick to, for example, if you just um, like Let's say I've done a split and I want to like I want to make a pause in, in here. Like I do I can do it in multiple ways. I can split and then drag the boundary in or I can select this and just press K. Could be faster. So for a single region J and K that is trimming are doing the same thing as dragging the region bounds. But for multiple regions let me select them on two different tracks. K is going to snap their endpoints to the same place, so it's not going to work relatively. If I were to click and drag the edit, the endpoints of them, that's going to work relatively. K will just snap them to the same place. And of course, if you select multiple regions on one track and do that, they're going to end up overlapping each other, which might not be what you want. Now there's some more trimming options if you go to the region menu and select the trim submenu. Now, same as with audio regions, you can join MIDI regions together using the range tool. Let's select the range tool either with the toolbar button or by pressing the R hotkey. Now if I select the range on my timeline, I can right click and select consolidate range. And Ardor is going to ask me for a new name for the region that's going to be created, but we can just press enter to dismiss that. And now we have a new region that contains the sum of all of the regions that were here previously. By the way, another cool thing we can do with the range mode, R, is to crop. Now if I select a range on my timeline, then right click and select crop region to range, it's going to delete parts of the region that were outside of the range. Now, we can't select regions while selecting a range also, but this tool works for multiple regions as well. If we just select a range on multiple tracks, for example, and right-click Crop Region to Range, it's going to crop all the regions that were intersecting our selection. Now, another basic operation is copying MIDI regions, and this can be done in multiple ways, just as with audio regions. The most basic way we can do with the range tool again is to select a range and then right click and select duplicate range. What it's going to do is spawn an exact copy touching head to tail. The hotkey is Alt D and we can press this multiple times to create more and more duplicates as it's going to shift our selection to the last created duplicate. Let me undo that. Now another thing we can do is hit the Shift D shortcut on the keyboard, where we can type in the number of duplicates we want. Let's say four. In theory, you can type in fractions, but uh, when I tried that, it crashed Ardor. Well, that's new. So maybe don't do that. Now, this one won't shift our selection to the last duplicate created, which kind of makes sense. Another very simple way to make duplicates is just to hold Control, click and drag and we can create duplicates this way. Also, 
if you hold control and click with your middle mouse button instead of the left one, you can shift the duplicate to a different track. And if you control and middle click and drag down outside of existing tracks, Ardor will create a new MIDI track to hold your MIDI region. Same with audio tracks, by the way. So that's a secret way of creating MIDI tracks. Let's delete this track, by the way. Now, same as with the range tool, we can also duplicate with the grab tool. So Alt-D is going to duplicate the region or selected regions as a group. And Shift-D will also open up this duplicate dialog where you can type in the number. Last but not least, you can just copy and paste selections uh, anywhere you want. You can paste on different tracks, which also works with ranges, which is very useful and we're going to cover this in a moment. Let's copy a range and paste it here. This can be used to rearrange your track. This can be used to rearrange your track. Rearrange your swap song sections around and stuff. I'm going to cover this in a moment. Oh, by the way, if you go to the edit mode, control and drag will also work on MIDI notes. So you can copy them this way too. Alt D or Shift D will not and will copy the region instead. But control C and control V also work inside of MIDI regions. Okay, since you know how to create a mass by duplicating your MIDI regions frantically, now would be a good time to learn how to delete them afterwards. Let's go to the grab mode. So the first most basic way is to select a MIDI region, right click and select remove. So the most basic way to delete a MIDI region is just to right click on it, select its name and select remove. But that's super slow, I don't recommend you do that. Just select it and hit the delete key instead. What you can also do is just hold shift on your keyboard and right click. That will delete a MIDI region, a MIDI note, or an automation point, or even a plugin in the processor box. But that one has no undo. Fuck! It won't delete a track though, and I think that's good. Another way to delete MIDI regions is of course by selecting multiple of them and just hitting delete. Or using the range tool, we can select the range and clear it by hitting delete, of course. What I'm going to talk about now is a little bit tangential, but since we're dealing with MIDI, it's important. So I want to talk about the difference between how MIDI automation behaves and the regular automation behaves, and how do you deal with that in Ardor. So basically, in Ardor, there's two ways of storing automation data. There is the normal way, which um, works with fader automation, mute automation, plugin parameters, panning, etc. And that data is stored in the .ardor project file. But there's also MIDI automation. And MIDI automation is stored in the individual .mid files, each one representing one of the regions on the timeline. If you control right click on a region, you can see the name of the source file right here. And this file is what contains the automation for MIDI pitch band, uh, mod wheel, any arbitrary MIDI CC automations and extra stuff like MIDI program changes or sysaxis, I don't know. So when you have a region and you have plugin automation underneath, if you move the region, the automation stays behind. Now, if you have a MIDI region which has MIDI automation, when you move that, the automation goes along with that. And the problem is, and this is especially uh, troublesome if you have synth sections that have both MIDI automation and plugin automation, because these will go out of sync if you try to move them the usual way. So the solution to this problem I found is to use the range tool. So let's hit R on the keyboard to enable the range mode. Now I'm going to select a range, then press and hold control and click on the automation lane header to select it. Now, if I press Ctrl C, I will copy this range along with the automation. Now, if I put my mouse somewhere else and I do Ctrl Z, you can see that I've pasted this MIDI region along with its automation. But if I went to the grab mode and just move this on its own, it would not follow. So here we have a region that has both plugin automation and MIDI automation. Let's use the range mode 
to select this range. As you can see, it automatically selects my MIDI automation lanes because they belong to the same region. Now I'm going to hold Control and click on these automation lane headers to select all of that. Control C will copy it. Control V will paste a duplicate. And you can see we have all of that coming along nicely. We can also cut to move our parts somewhere else and paste. All right, let's scale this up a bit. Let's say you want to shuffle around some song sections or just copy and paste the song section. Now, again, I believe the range tool is the only way to do this without pulling your hair out. Yeah. So make sure you're in the range mode. First, let's make sure we can see as much vertically as possible. So I'm going to click on this drop down and select all. So it's going to compress my tracks. Now, this project has way too many tracks to fit them all in one screen. Now, let's say I want to copy this drop. Okay, where does it end first? Need to find. All right, there. So I'm going to click and drag. Now, let's press Ctrl T on the keyboard to select all the tracks. As you can see, it has conveniently omitted all the automation lanes for us. So we need to select them one by one manually. And if we screw up, we need to start over. So hit and hold control and click. Click, 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 click. You, you get, get the idea. Okay, we have everything selected. Now, be very careful to not click somewhere randomly because we'll have to do this again. Now, the good thing about the range mode is that once we have this all selected, you can click on the edges to drag and reposition them so we don't have to reselect all of our tracks and lanes when we want to paste that or do some other shuffling. So when you want to restructure a song, it's best to do this in one go so you have to select all this stuff just once. Now, I really hope that the Ardor team can come up with a better way to do that, and uh, I have reported the issues. All right, let's maybe cut this section. I'm going to hit Ctrl X, and as you can see, it's gone. Now, let's zoom out a little bit, and maybe I will change my edit point to playhead so that it's easier for us to make sure we're pasting this stuff in the right place. I'm gonna find an empty spot on my timeline to paste this track section temporarily. Okay, I'm gonna hit Ctrl V. So let's listen and see if it, if it does sound correctly. Yep, that's proper. All right, now let's say we want to copy and paste something else into that spot we've made empty. Now, because we have all of these tracks selected, I believe I just click and drag, it should... Oh my goodness, yes, it works. Okay, so if you just click and drag, it's going to select a range in your timeline without changing the selected tracks and automation lanes, all right? So we can now pick another section of the song. Let's say I want to use this part of the of the song and replace it with that other one. I'm going to copy. Now let's move our playhead back, find the place where we need to paste. Let's move the playhead where we need to paste and go Control Z. <laughs> now there's one important thing that I missed before copying and cutting and pasting. You see, my grid is pretty fine, and that is not fine. When copying sections of songs, it's best to use the bar grid, because that makes sure you're not gonna cut like that. While we're at the topic of restructuring your song, I'd like to point out that you can insert empty space at any point in your project. You can also remove that. To do so, put your playhead at the place where you want to insert empty space. Let's say we want to make a new section right between these two. Now hit Ctrl T on your keyboard to select all the tracks. Don't worry about the automation lanes, they will follow anyway. More of that, please! Now, from the track menu, select Insert Time. As you can see, 
the location of our playhead, visible on the first clock, has been copied to this insert time at dial. Now what we need to do is define how much time we want to insert. What I do is right click on this second clock, change it to bars, beats, and now these values are bars, beats, and ticks. So this is in musical time. Let me click on that with the left mouse button and now we can type. Let's say we want to insert 16 bars. Let's type in 16 and now fill it up with zeros until the 16 is in the bars field. Okay, now with the settings. We can define what's going to happen when our playhead is intersecting some regions. And let's let's split such regions. Now let's apply it to all the playlists. Let's move glued to musical time regions. Let's move markers, move locked markers, and move tempo and meter changes. The safest way is just to enable everything when you want to insert a section on your song. Let's hit insert time. And now we can see we have brand new 16 empty bars to fill with new music. Now we can reverse that by going to track, remove time. This dialog is a bit simpler. Let's again change the second clock's type to bars beats. Now let's type in 16, pad it with zeros. And again, apply to all playlists, move markers, move locked markers, and move tempo meter changes. Let's remove time. And as you can see, it has removed this new empty space that we've just created. I guess that's going to be useful for inserting new sections of your song. Media regions can be stretched just like audio regions using the time stretch tool. To use it, hit T on your keyboard, then click and drag on the region you want to stretch to set the new length. When you release your mouse button, all the region contents are going to be stretched to fill the new length. The time stretch tool can also work on multiple regions. Let's select these two regions and time stretch one of them to be twice as long. As you can see, both have been scaled to 200% of their original length. We've discussed differences between media and regular automation in regards to moving and copying data around. Now let's take a closer look at what we can do with media automation in Ardor. Or what we can't. Something you'll probably use the most is pitch bend automation, called Bender. Unfortunately, using this is not exactly a smooth experience. Let me show you why. To add a Bender automation lane, click on this A button, as usual, select Bender, and select the MIDI channel you want to use. Bender starts in the neutral position, which is 8192. What? You see, MIDI pitch bend is stored as a 14-bit digital number which means it can have values between 0 and 16,384. 8,192 is right in the middle, being the neutral position. Unfortunately, Ardor doesn't do anything to make this any easier on the users and just exposes the raw MIDI data and says, Deal with it. It's fine if all you ever want to do is capture and play your performances, but editing this by hand is just a pain in my shiny metal. I've reported issues with the Bender automation back in 2017, by the way. So how do I use Bender automation? A big problem here is that there's no easy way of telling what value here is going to correspond to what amount of semitones. Of course, you could go down and get your synth's MIDI pitch bend range and calculate what a magical number in this thing will correspond to four semitones when you have 12 semitone range, but isn't this exactly what computers are for? That's why if I need some precise pitch slides, I'm going to use Portamento, and if needed, I will automate the Portamento time instead of using pitch bend. But I'm still using pitch bend automation for a few things. First, if I only need small pitch bends like only one or two semitones up and down, I can manage that. And it's often faster than using Portamento. Sometimes I'll also make the pitch bend range in my synthesizer 24 semitones up and down to use it for special effects with no regard to tune or scale. One thing you'll definitely want to use is an option in Ardor 
which is called Ignore Y axis position when inserting new automation points. Let me show you where to enable it. Go to Edit, Preferences, Editor, and here in Edit Behavior, you see there's an option Ignore Y axis click position when adding new automation points. Enable this now and thank me later. So what this does is when we insert a point, it's going to automatically put it between previously existing values. Now this is a huge help for vendor automation because there is nothing that helps you snap back to the neutral position. Nothing. If you have your points messing around, there is no help. What you have to do is right click, click on edit, and type in from memory 8192, hit enter, and that's how you reset to neutral position. So enabling this option that ignores vertical position of your clicks is, is a lifesaver. One very important thing that's going to save you a lot of pain also is locking the movement to horizontal only. And you do that by holding shift before you click on your point. This way you can move these points without changing their value. So you don't have to... Right click, select edit and type 8192 enter over and over again. Okay, let's make a very easy and simple automation pattern here. Now I have a surge synthesizer on this track and let me disable this. Or even let's clear this track. If you right click here, you can clear the automation. You can also hide the automation lane. Let's open it again, Bender, channel one. So this Surge synthesizer patch has a pitch bend range of two semitones up and down. All right, let's insert two points. I'm gonna click on the start and click on the end. Because we're snapping to 16th notes, these automation points should play right on top. Now, another problem with Bender automation is that if you shorten your MIDI region, so that the last point is on the edge, the last point will just disappear and not show. And if you copy the region and extend it, it's not even going to be there anymore. So for that reason, when you make this kind of stuff, you should move your points a little bit to the left. But unfortunately, there is no snapping to prevent it from moving vertically when you move horizontally. So after that, you need to right click, go edit and type again, 8192, hit enter. Now I can shorten this region so it is just as long as the phrase. And now if I copy this, it's gonna look and work correctly, even though we have a small gap here. But if we don't have this gap, it's just gonna break. Okay, let's add a little pitch slide. So this note starts with a two semitone ramp down. All right. And let's do a similar thing with this one and just start from uh, an upwards ramp. Now I want to interpolate between these notes. So I'm going to add points. Emulating portamento with pitch bend is inherently a bad idea and it's not a tool for that. So this is not gonna work well. And now this note is two semitones higher than this one, so I'm going to go all the way up. Then I will snap back, and I will have to, again, right-click, edit, and type 8192. Eight, I have done this hundreds of times. And let's play it. Oh, and it's broken. Uh, yes, you see Bender automation messes up if you have points too close to each other. So what you actually have to do is move this a little bit forward. All right, it seems it's correct now. Let's insert another point here and another point here and move this down. And I'm going to move it to the left a little bit. I'm going to hold Alt to release myself from the grid. And this should be more or less correct. It's not correct by a long shot, I don't know why. Oh, it doesn't reset, okay, okay. Yeah, see, you see, the automation, uh, Bender automation is very picky and sometimes you just need to insert a bunch of extra points to make sure it actually plays them. 
it's mostly okay, but we are having these little clicks in here, which are just the artifact of us not being able to do this fast enough. Pitch bend automation is not good for this kind of stuff. Yes, it exposes a bunch of problems with the pitch bend automation, but also it shows us that this is not the right thing to do if we want to achieve this effect. What you really want to do is remove this note altogether and this one too, just make it a single note, <coughs> delete, move this up, delete these points, move this up, or even just delete that point, and then we can even delete these points because we don't need them anymore. Maybe even this one. And let's play it. This is what Bender automation can do and what it can do well. So yes, automation in Ardor is not great. Uh, pitch bend automation is particularly nasty, but with some stamina and clever tricks, you can get it to do your bidding. MIDI CC automation lanes have a setting called interpolation. Actually, it's called mode. And by default, it's in linear mode. If you create a MIDI region with the draw tool, which creates straight ramps between points, but you can also switch it to discrete, which will create these stair step patterns. And the discrete mode is by default used when you record something with your keyboard. What else do we have there? There is state. You can disable an automation lane so it has no effect. That's great for testing out if one MIDI CC lane is doing something funky you don't want. Now, a bit more interesting is the non-standard MIDI CC automation. You can access the list of all MIDI CCs by clicking on this A button and selecting controllers. Now, the names of these controllers, as well as of their amount, is defined by this dropdown here. Some plugins, for example, the stock general MIDI synthesizer plugin, will provide Ardor with a list of MIDI CCs that it supports. That's why we have this nice list here with all the numbers being named. If I go to a different track, say the Surge one, you can see that there is no plugin provided drop down here. And when I click on the A, button and select controllers, you can see that we have basically everything that the MIDI standard supports. And we have the names for general MIDI standard MIDI CCs. So the first one is modulation, breath, etc. And this might not necessarily correspond to what you're going to have in the synthesizer. Now, if we create a MIDI track which has no plugin at all, for example, we want to use it with a hardware synthesizer. Of course, by default, it goes with a generic MIDI setup. But if we click on this drop down, there's a whole bunch of different synthesizer vendors. And each one is going to give you a list of instruments. If I select, for example, Waldorf Blofeld and hit the A button and go to controllers, you can see we have a list of controllers which are specific to the Blofeld hardware synthesizer, which is very nice because you can um, select the stuff you need and write your automations without looking up a spec sheet. I wish I knew how to get back to this generic one. MMA generic? What is MMA generic? Is this the generic one? Yeah, that's the generic. Why, why is it an MMA? If we open the track automation menu again, you can see that I've covered Bender, I've covered controllers, I haven't touched on pressure or polyphonic pressure. And honestly, I have nothing to say about them because I don't really know how they work. I think that they're just another MIDI CCs. Maybe they have something to do with MPE and yeah, never use them. If you'd like to learn more about automation in general and specifically automation in Ardor, I have given a live presentation about this on Sony Convention 2018. You can click on the card right there to watch the whole thing. A new and a very useful feature in Ardor 6 is that it can automatically route a MIDI keyboard controller or a dance pad to the currently selected MIDI track. This removes the need for constant manual managing of your connections when you just want to hear what your track will sound like or 
tweak your patch. I think this greatly improves Ardor MIDI workflow. To use this feature, let's go to Edit, Preferences, MIDI. Now, for this feature to work, the MIDI input follows MIDI track selection, global setting has to be enabled. Like this is the switch that makes this all do nothing or do something. And you can see we have two tables. We're only interested in MIDI inputs for now. Now, I have a bunch of stuff here because of my recording setup. Normally, you'll only see physical inputs and maybe MIDI through and the virtual MIDI keyboard. The virtual keyboard we've talked about earlier has all of this enabled by default, which I think is great because you don't have to come in here and enable it and it's going to just follow any MIDI track you select in the editor. All right, let's find my MIDI keyboard. Here it is. Let's select music data and also, where did it go? And also follow selection. Uh, I think this is scrolling something weirdly. Okay, I have enabled it. Now let's test this. I'm going to create two MIDI tracks with the default general MIDI synthesizer on them. And I'm going to pan one to the left and one to the right. Now let's play a note on the keyboard. As you can hear, when I play on the MIDI keyboard, the MIDI input is being automatically assigned to the currently selected MIDI track. And if we click here, or rather right click on the routing grid, you can see our Oxygen 49 keyboard is being connected to it. And also our virtual MIDI keyboard is being connected to it. Remember that if you ever want to disable this feature, the last grid connection will remain active and you will have to remove it manually. Now, one problem the automatic MIDI input routing may cause is that if you hit some notes and then change the track, the MIDI note on the first track will never end because the MIDI off message has been sent on a different MIDI track. For a naturally decaying sound like a piano, this isn't that big of a problem because it's going to get silent anyway. But for a sustained synthesizer patch, this might be a problem because if I play a note, change the track, now this note will stay on forever unless I select it and play that note again. And when I release it, the original stuck note is going to go away too. But there's an easier way to deal with this kind of problem. Let me just show you. This is the perfect time to talk about the MIDI panic. MIDI panic is a function that silences all currently playing MIDI notes. You can trigger it by clicking on this button with the exclamation point on the left part of the transport toolbar, or by hitting Control and tilde. If I play a chord, if I hit the MIDI panic shortcut, it silences my chord even though even though I'm still holding the keys down. Have this handy in case you're going to need it. <laughs> All right, let's now talk about general MIDI control surfaces and recording automation with a MIDI controller. It is possible to assign a MIDI CC input to various controls in Ardor interface. What that allows us to do is to control faders, buttons, and automatable plugin parameters with physical sliders or knobs, like these ones here. There's a bunch of different control surface protocols, but I'm going to only cover the MIDI part in this video for obvious reasons. This could be used for recording fader or plugin automation or for live performances. So, due to the fact that this feature is quite underdeveloped in Ardor, I would rather recommend you go for something like Carla if you want to play music live and control your plugins with a physical controller. Okay, let's go on and enable the generic MIDI control surface protocol. To get this to work, go to Edit, Preferences, select Control Surfaces, find generic MIDI in this table and enable it. Now we need to edit the protocol settings. We can do it by double clicking on its name or by using this little button here. Here we have two drop-down lists where we can select input and output MIDI devices. 
If I click here, you can see I have Oxygen 49, which is my physical MIDI keyboard. Now, I'm not going to use outgoing MIDI because this keyboard has no feedback. That means its faders are not motorized, nor any of the other controls have any way to reflect the state of these controls if I change them in a DAW. Some controllers do have these features, and in such case, if you select your device and also enable feedback and enable motorized, you should be able to get your faders and rotary encoders move along with your automation in Ardor. I haven't tested that, however, because I don't have appropriate hardware. Let me know if you have. All right, so let's disable these features because I'm not going to use them. Now, an important thing here is we can select default MIDI bindings from a list of available presets. And my keyboard is listed here as M Audio Oxygen 49. Even though my model is Mark IV, it works. Now, an important thing to change in here, in my opinion, is this smoothing parameter, which by default, I believe, goes on the value of 10. Now, the name of this parameter is very misleading because it's not really smoothing anything. What this should be called, in my opinion, is smooth takeover. As it behaves exactly like a parameter in mix, called by the same name. So in the mix, this feature is disabled by default. So what this is, is a threshold of difference between the physical control's position and the control in Ardor. If the difference between your physical fader and the fader in Ardor is greater than 10, your movements will be ignored. Why is this important? Uh, if you want to record automation with fast movements, it's going to be pretty easy to make a move where between the time Ardor gets information from the MIDI device, that this difference is already going to be greater, in which case the automation will just stop following you. Uh, I find this very annoying, and I guess it's made to prevent sudden volume spikes when, for example, your gain parameter was at negative 20 decibels, but you've been using your knob for something else, and now you're moving it when it's assigned to this thing, and suddenly it jumps to plus 20 decibels and blows your speakers. But Ardor doesn't have any pagination features that I know of, and I know quite a lot about it. So this doesn't really make sense. What I recommend you to do is set this to maximum value of 127. As you probably know, MIDI CCs are encoded as 7-bit digital numbers, which gives them a possible value range between 0 and 127. So if I set this to 127, what that means is no matter how fast you move the fader, this threshold is still going to let it through and other will react. Now I'm going to demonstrate this to you in practice. And let's record fader automation. Now to assign a control to a physical MIDI controller, what you need to do is hold control and middle click on a widget in Ardor's UI. Now we have this little dialog window saying operate controller now. And what this does is it's waiting for us to touch a controller on our physical device so it can learn what that controller is and assign it. So now if I move my control, you can see that the fader is moving too. And we can record our automation like this. If I change this automation lane state to right, we can play our transport. And now if I move my control, we can record automation. Let's zoom in. Let me now change the smoothing value to the default 10. And let's do this again. As you can see, by the way, the automation lane changed its state from right to touch. Mm. What touch does is it's a blend between play and write. And that is, if you're not touching the control, it's going to play back what's already there. But if you're going to touch it, it's going to overwrite what was there. Now, look what happens if I do a fast movement. My fast movements are completely ignored. Only the slowest portions of my movement were registered. And that's because of this smoothing being set very low. Let's try this again. Now, if I do some fast movements, 
you can see that even the fastest movements have been registered completely. And this is what I think is uh, usually better. So I recommend you keep this at 127. All right, now if we want to record this for a plugin, let's maybe take this surge patch and go to automation, processor automation, or we could use a filter one cutoff. I'm going to control and middle click on this. And now I'm going to move a knob. Okay, move my control and here we are. Now this filter, I believe is not enabled. Yeah, now I have control over this filter. And if I set this to right and also record my MIDI, we can record both our notes and the automation at the same time. Again, Ardor automatically switches the automation lanes that have the right state to touch state after you stop the transport to prevent you from accidentally overwriting your automation. However, I like to switch them to play mode, so there is no way I'm going to overwrite my automation by mistake. Let's close this dialog because we don't need it anymore and let's play this and see how it works. Well, basically, it has captured our performance. Nice. Now, this MIDI control surface protocol also supports transport controls. Uh, what that means is I can use the transport buttons on my controller to control transport in Ardor. And how I do it with my controller is I need to switch it to the auto mode. And then these buttons do work as proxy for my transport controls. Now, I have tried to map them manually without using the, the keyboard preset in the MIDI control surface settings, but I wasn't able to do that. So I guess if you have a device that has transport controls, but you don't have a preset in order, contact the developers, and I'm sure they will help you out in getting your device to work. Now, if you'd like to remove an assigned physical control from a virtual control in order, let's say I don't want this filter cutoff to be controlled by this knob anymore. What you need to do is, again, hold down control, middle click on the control, and now click on the button. What this will do is remove the assigned link. And that's pretty much it for binding physical MIDI controllers to controls in Ardor. There's not much to it. There isn't a list of all the controls you've assigned, a modulation matrix or any way to review what's there or alter it or temporarily disable it or, or save presets. Like, it's very, very simple. It's okay if you want to record some automation, but I would not recommend it for live performances. It's really not designed for that. I guess you could get some more stuff out of that if you were to hack the project file and try to see what you can do there. But this is not a video for hackers, but for musicians, so I'm, I'm gonna pass. Exporting MIDI data from Ardor only works for single regions. To do that, you need to right-click on a MIDI region, like this one, choose its name, and choose Export. There's also a shortcut for that, Control alt e What this will do is show you a file select dialog where you can select the location and the name of your file to be exported. And that's pretty much it. If you wanted to, for example, export your whole session, I think what you could do is um, separate all your MIDI tracks and give them different MIDI channels and then consolidate every single track on its own for the whole length of the project and finally drop them all onto a single track and consolidate this so that all of the MIDI data from all the tracks on different MIDI channels are in one single region and then you can just export it. Now that's not convenient and I haven't tried that because I never needed that but I think it's the only option right now to export MIDI from Ardor if you want the whole project. Usually people ask for stems anyway. Now, importing MIDI data is pretty simple. 
What you can do is right click on a MIDI track and select insert existing media. What you can do then is select your previously exported or otherwise MIDI region and hit import. Of course, there are settings. You can import to select a track to a new track or just to the source list, which is on the editor list. You can also select the timeline position of the selected file, for example, at playhead. And we can also import the MIDI tempo map if it's defined in the file. Let's do this. And it seems we have imported a MIDI tempo map, which kind of messed up our project. I don't really know where is our region, though. Okay, let's try this again. I'm going to insert a mystery MIDI region. Uh, where is it? Oh, there it is. All right, I imported a mystery MIDI region. I think you recognize it. Now, another way to import a MIDI region is simply to drag and drop it from your file manager onto the track you want. And in which case it's going to insert it at the mouse position. What you can also do is scroll down to your session and drag in a MIDI region below the last existing track. In which case, Ardor is going to create a new MIDI track for the new region before importing it. We're almost done. There's very few things left to talk about. What's really awesome about Ardor is that you can easily extend its functionality with the Lua scripting language. And Ardor comes packed with a few scripts out of the box. Some of them can help you with MIDI stuff. In the top right corner of Ardor's interface, you can see these four buttons with numbers. They're grayed out. But when you click on one of them, a dialog appears where you can select what script that launcher button will trigger when you click it. I'm going to select Polyphonic Audio to MIDI. Yes. Now I'm going to click Add. And you can see that the first button has changed its look and now it has a note icon on it. So. What this does is it takes an audio region and produces a MIDI region with MIDI data analyzed and produced based on audio data. I've read that it's working best with piano and guitar music, so I've prepared a little test MIDI part for piano, which I'm going to now record to audio, and then we're going to reproduce the MIDI back from audio. So this track feeds audio into this audio track, I'm going to record it. Make sure that you leave some empty space in front of the audio region because otherwise we may lose a few first notes. Okay, now we need an empty MIDI region and I've prepared an empty MIDI track for this purpose right there. Let's go to the draw mode and create a MIDI region. Now, it doesn't have to align with the audio region at all. It can be whatever. Let's switch to the grab mode. I'm going to select the audio region. Now hold control and select the media region as well. Now, I'm just going to trigger the script. And there's our MIDI. Let's listen to the generated MIDI. Now, it's not perfect. There are a few mistakes. For example, this note here is an octave. And uh, also it messed up right here somehow, but the tonality is okay. And this can be useful. There are other scripts that can help you with MIDI stuff. And you can find them if you go to Edit, Lua Scripts, Script Manager. And here, there's a bunch of actions. These actions one, two, three, four are what these buttons here do. And if you select one of them and click Add Set, you can select any of the scripts. For example, there's a script that turns MIDI CC to plugin automation. But I am going to leave all of that for you to explore later. We wouldn't want this beautiful head of yours exploding from information overload, would we? The last feature I want to talk about is something that probably no one besides developers has ever heard about. Let me know if you knew about it before I mentioned it, because that means you're amazing. <laughs> Step Entry is an interesting feature for classically trained musicians. 
if you right click on the record button on the MIDI track, you get this little context menu. And on the bottom of it, you can select step entry. It's going to do two things. It's going to create a MIDI region for you, which is this weird black color. And also a special MIDI entry input dialog appears, similar to the virtual keyboard, though it has a bunch of classical musical symbols in it. Now what you could do with it is input MIDI data as if you were doing so in a program like MuseScore, for example. Let me give you a breakdown of all the controls we have here, starting from the left. Now, by default, this interface will insert one note at a time and then jump to the next one. But if you click this chord button, it's going to stack all the notes you insert, creating a chord. Now, if I release this button, you can see that it advances the input cursor. All right, with this next section of buttons here, we can select the length of the note we want to insert. For example, quarter notes. Next up, we have six buttons up here. The first one inserts a pause instead of a note. And the length of the pause is, of course, determined by this note length selection here. Now, G rest inserts a rest note. There's also double dotted, so a quarter note would become a quarter note plus an eighth note plus a sixteenth note. And there's even triple dotted notes. I don't know who uses them, but someone probably does and needs it right here. Now, if you use the sustain button, what it's going to do is make the note you inserted before be extended for the duration of the next note so we can overlap your notes. Next up, we have six buttons up here. The first one inserts a pause instead of a note. And the length of the pause is, of course, determined by this note length selection here. Now, G rest inserts a rest of the units, of the grid's unit length. Right now, my grid unit length is a 30 seconds note. If I make this a bar, we can make a bar long rest here. Oh, I think it doesn't work like that, actually. Yeah, I think something is not right. <coughs> we can also go back by the length of this note. So I can go back a uh, whole note or forward. There's also ways to insert a rest until the next beat. If we go to quarter notes, or the next bar, or to the edit point, which can be whatever we select. For example, the mouse cursor position. Oh, um, I think the edit point was somewhere else. Uh, let's maybe try and get our cursor back here. Okay, let's snap it to the bar, and there we go. Now. After that, we have a section where we can choose the dynamics of our notes. By default, we are using mezzo forte, which corresponds to 64 velocity. We can go to forte fortissimo, fortissimo and forte and piano, pianissimo, pianissimo, piano, mezzo piano, etc. All the classical terms. And all of them are actually mapped to different MIDI note velocity numbers, as you can see here. And that brings us to the last section to the right. You can see we have all the, very, all the various parameters of MIDI notes, and we can directly verify and affect them. We can change the MIDI channel that the notes are inserted on. If we, for example, are driving multiple instruments with this single MIDI track, we can change the note length by mm, using this note length division number. So one by four is a quarter note, of course. One by one is a whole note. So I don't know why this is not a whole note. 13 seconds later. Oh, it's because I'm using this triple dotted one. Okay, let's reset it to undotted. And now the whole note should be an actual whole note. Let's snap it to the bar. Yes, we have a whole note. We can also change the MIDI bank and program numbers. 
I have never used this, so I don't know what it does, honestly. And we have these two plus buttons, which uh, are used to insert the actual MIDI messages at the given point to change the bank or the program. And that's pretty much all there is to the step entry. That's all! Congratulations on reaching the end of this video. I know it's been very long and it's been forever since I announced I'm making it, but it was a really huge project and <sighs> yeah, it wasn't easy to complete. <laughs> I hope this video was worth your time, even though it was really long. I wanted to make a single, undivided, complete tutorial for MIDI in Ardor so that anyone can just watch it all and know what they don't know, have place to reference they, what they forgot or uh, what the fuck. Thank you for sticking with me through the process of making of this video and for your great support. Uh, I really want to thank all the people who are supporting me financially. Uh, if you, dear viewer, would like me to make more of this kind of stuff and would like to join these people, please go to patreon.com slash anfa or liberapay.com slash anfa, where you can support me with a monthly donation. And this is greatly appreciated. Now, I am aware that this video will slowly and inevitably become outdated. And I think I might revisit it once Ardor 7 is out. But, well, it depends on how this video is received, if it will get enough attention and if just basically I, I'm going to see if it's going to be worth the effort. Also, you can find the complete script for this video, which is kind of like a written tutorial. Uh, the link is in the video description. Also, feel free to join my community on chat.anfa.xyz. There's a lot of great things happening there and a lot of helpful people who are sharing their ideas and inspirations and also solving issues for each other. And I'd love to see you there too. Now go and make some music with Ardor Midi. Can't believe I'm done. Now it's time to edit this beast. I'm gonna have like four hours of bloopers. Oh. I'm gonna need the power of strong coffee for this one. <laughs>